um, co-editor of Monthly Review Magazine and is a renowned Marxist. And without any further ado, Mr. Sweezy. Can you all hear all right? No. Is, there's nothing back there? Is this one working? Can you hear back there? Okay, I'll try to talk loud then. Maybe it's better if you can't hear. Somebody is working on it. So we'll get it from now. I said that because I'm going to try to do something that's impossible. The subject, announced subject, is the global crisis of capitalism, and it's too big to handle in an hour. Uh, that's probably partly my fault. I forget who decided on the title. And what I want to do is something that's very hard to do, and that is treat the subject both uh, in breadth and historically uh, to give it a coherent whole wholeness and at the same time, do it in a kind of impressionistic way, skipping around, using a few facts here and there to try, as an impressionistic painter might try to do, to fill in a whole canvas. And when you get away from it a little, maybe make it coherent. Now, the, the first reason, <coughs> excuse me, and indeed the, the main justification for speaking of a global crisis of capitalism is that capitalism is, and from its early days has been, a, a global system. It is not just a collection of discrete capitalist countries, some developed, some undeveloped, some underdeveloped, some developing. It's a system in which all these are linked together and it has an overall structure. Its parts are intermeshed in definite ways, and it has what Marx called laws of motion. The structure, I think, is best understood in terms of the center-periphery metaphor. The transition from center to periphery is not clear-cut and abrupt but graduated in a series of concentric rings which merge into each other. At the center of the center is the hegemonic power in the present historical period, the United States of America, with the greatest concentration of wealth and military power. Around it are grouped the secondary imperialist powers, Britain, Germany, France, Japan, Holland. Next come the lesser developed capitalist countries, the Scandinavian countries, Belgium, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Canada, Australia. And beyond this is where the periphery begins. The inner ring of the periphery consists of what may be called regional sub-imperialist powers, Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, Israel, Iran, at least until recently, <laughs> perhaps India. And finally, there are the outer rings of the periphery comprising the great majority of underdeveloped third world countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. All of these make up a coherent whole with various lines of authority and subordination running from the center of the center clear out to the edges of the periphery. 
And generally speaking, there is a reverse flow of money and its counterpart, real wealth, from the outer edges of the periphery through the intermediate rings to the center, and finally, the center of the center. The whole not only constitutes a coherent whole, but also a kind of a pyramid of power and wealth, to mix the metaphor a little. And on the other hand, a system of exploitation of weaker by stronger at every stage of transition from center, periphery to center, and from bottom to top. The various units in the system naturally have an interest in maintaining and, if possible, improving their relative positions. Hence, even in the best of times, the system is in a state of constant agitation. Sufficient shifts in relative power can easily send it into a local or even global convulsion which bring about, brings about uh, realignment and new patterns of authority and subordination. The biggest of these convulsions, of course, have been the two world wars. Most of the other realignments of a more local kind also involve wars, which may start either as wars of aggression or as wars of defense attempts at aggrandizement or at repulsing such attempts by others. What is the driving force of the system, the force that keeps it from settling down into a stable pattern of subordination and superordination? The answer can be summed up in three words, the accumulation of capital. Every unit of capital has an inherent and ineradicable urge to expand. They don't all succeed, of course. Some fall by the wayside or are gobbled up by more efficient or ruthless rivals. But they all try. And the ones that survive are the successful ones. By the same token, every capitalist country, made up as it is of units of capital, must always be tending to expand, but not all at the same rate. So there is inherent unevenness in rates of growth, hence in wealth and power, and those which are more dynamic are the ones that seek to improve their relative standing at the expense of others. This is the why, why there can never be a settling down in the system as a whole, never an equilibrium that is more than temporary and, for the most part, precarious. Now, the capital accumulation process, which is the motor force, does not proceed smoothly within capitalist countries any more than it does between them. It is fraught with what Marxists like to call contradictions, which cause it to proceed in the form of cycles or waves, and from time to time generate more serious blockages and crises. As between countries, these cycles and crises may be synchronized or may be out of phase. When they are synchronized, they reinforce each other. When they are out of phase, they may tend to offset each other. The rhythm may be such as to build up pressures in the system as a whole or in segments of it, which find an outlet in jockeying for superior position against rivals. The number of possible permutations and combinations is very large, if not infinite. This is why the behavior of the global system, though it can be understood and analyzed, 
can never be predicted and is always full of unexpected surprises. The engine of an automobile, at least most automobiles, is under the hood. That's the component that moves the whole vehicle. Similarly, the engine of the global capitalist system, the locus of change and motion in the whole system, is in the advanced countries of the center. It is the process of capital investment accumulation there in the center which determines and dominates the system's law of laws of motion. The periphery reacts to and is shaped by what happens in the center. Or to put it in a different way, the center enjoys a large degree of independence while the periphery has virtually no independence. It follows that for the countries and peoples of the periphery, independence can be gained, if it can be gained at all, only by breaking out of the system and starting on a fresh foundation. It further follows that to the extent the peoples of the periphery aspire to independence, and the inclination in that direction seem strong and persistent, they can realistically pursue their objective only by actively revolting against the economic and political ties that bind them to the global capitalist system. Now, that's a sort of a very rough and very schematic framework within which to conduct an analysis. And I'd like next to review very briefly the development of the global capitalist system in recent times. The formative period begins in the late 15th and early 16th centuries with the overseas expansion of the European mercantilist countries. Spain, Portugal, Holland, France, and Britain. Colonial empires, the origins of today's periphery, were built, and the nascent capitalist countries of what would become today's center fought it out for hegemony. Finally, Britain emerged as the clearly dominant hegemonic power following the defeat of France in the Napoleonic Wars. This situation lasted until roughly the last quarter of the 19th century when a fresh burst of external expansion and colonization erupted, accompanied by a renewed struggle for hegemony, this time among France, Germany, the USA, and Britain as the still hegemonic power but being attacked by the others or challenged. And Japan soon joined the fray as the first non-white imperialist power of modern times. This phase culminated in the First World War, which marked the defeat of the German bid for hegemony. The rise of the US to rough parity with Britain, the far-reaching reshuffling of colonies and spheres of influence in the periphery, and significant augury of things to come, the Russian Revolution, and the first massive breakaway from the global system itself. For a few years in the 1920s, a relative equilibrium was established under what was in effect a shared Anglo-American hegemony. But as it was extraordinarily short-lived. The British hegemony of the 19th century lasted more than a half a century. The Anglo-British hegemony after the Second World War, less than two decades. The rise of Nazism in Germany 
signaled a second German bid for hegemony. This time, in alliance with Japan, whose ambitions to profit from the outcome of the First World War in the Far East were frustrated by superior Anglo-American naval power. This renewed struggle for hegemony led directly to the Second World War. And it was the Second World War which set the stage for the development of the situation which is the focus of our attention here this evening. Let me list in shorthand what I see as the crucial results of that great conflict. Number one, there was the second defeat of Germany in its second bid for hegemonic position, the first defeat for Japan. Second, the weakening of Britain and France as a result of the war and their participation in it. Third, the rise to undisputed hegemony by the United States of America. Fourth, the defection of China from the global capitalist system following in the wake of Russia at the end of the First World War. The Russian defection took out of the global capitalist system the largest land mass in the world, the Chinese defection, the largest population mass in the world. And maturing in the periphery, this is the fifth consequence, was a whole series of national liberation struggles which had their origins, their beginnings as far back as the turn of the century, and in one or two cases even before, the case of India, for example, with a consequent and continuing replacement of colonialism by neo-colonialism, that is formal rule from the center by various informal modes of domination. The period of US hegemony, which began at the end of the Second World War, lasted for somewhat more than a quarter of a century. By the end of that time, it began to weaken as the defeated powers of the Second World War gradually recovered their strength and as national liberation struggles developed and threatened the structure of the system in its outlying regions. The global capitalist system always works best when there is one undisputed hegemonic power. And the erosion and ending of that undisputed hegemony always signals the onset of a time of troubles and crises. The post-Second World War period has been no exception. Under US hegemony, global capitalism had the benefits of a functioning and flexible international monetary system and a relatively free flow of international trade and capital. Gold and the US dollar were established by the Bretton Woods Accords of the late 40s as interchangeable forms of international currency. This, not so incidentally, gave the United States the equivalent of an inexhaustible gold mine. The growth of trade and payments created a huge demand for, increased, for an increased supply of universally acceptable forms of money. The, the US could and did, under the Bretton Woods system, satisfy this demand by running deficits in its balance of payments. 
thus pushing more and more dollars out into the economies and banking systems of the rest of the world. For the U.S., this privilege was a source of enormous power, enabling this country to draw on the resources of the whole world almost at will. It was also a source of temptation and danger. The temptation was to abuse the privilege of creating paper gold. The danger was that abuse would wreck the system. As we shall see, the temptation was too great for the U.S. to resist. But a workable monetary system and relatively free trade were not the only conditions favoring the accumulation of capital in the post-Second World War period. There were also the following to be considered. First, the need to repair the damages inflicted by the fighting. That was particularly true in Europe and Japan. Second, the availability of a great array of new capital-using technologies emerging from wartime developments. <coughs> Thirdly, the enormous demands created by the military needs of the hegemonic power, and to a lesser extent, its military allies. These were on a scale unprecedented in peacetime. These needs are inherent in the hegemonic position itself and have been swelled by the special conditions of this period. That is the growth of national liberation struggles in the third world and the efforts of the imperialist powers of the Senate to suppress or defeat these struggles. The outstanding examples, of course, are the major regional wars of Korea and Vietnam. I might point out also that uh, the difference between British military needs in the 19th century uh, and U.S. military needs in the period after the Second World War is in part due to changes in military technology and also geography. Britain could control its empire and most of the dependencies of Europe through the use of a navy in the 19th century. Most of the power centers in the third world, the popula populated and uh, economically valuable centers, were near the coasts and could be easily approached and dominated by a navy. After the Second World War, that was no longer true, and huge land and air armies were necessary, and they, of course, are enormously more expensive than a small, relative to what's needed nowadays, a small uh, professional navy. Against this background, we can understand that the end of the Second World War opened a period of unprecedented expansion and prosperity for the global capitalist system. Ever since 1945, until very recently, the upswings of the business cycle <coughs> were long by historical standards, the downswings short and shallow. The contradictions of capitalism so dear to the hearts of Marxists seem to have been so mitigated as not actually eliminated that they could be realistically thought of as things of the past. In the United States in particular, we experienced what C. Wright Mills ironically called the American celebration, while Daniel Bell and other writers of his persuasion spoke of the end of ideology. But underneath, <clears throat> and mostly out of sight, Certain long-term tendencies were at work, 
which pointed to stormy weather ahead. Here we may note a few of the more important of them. The list is by no means exhaustive. In the heady atmosphere of those years, optimism pervaded the business world here and abroad. Capitalists built for a supposedly endlessly expanding economy. Enormous amounts of capital equipment were piled up, especially in basic industries like steel, shipbuilding, motor cars, and so on. Such an investment boom, moreover, creates exaggerated prosperity in the short and medium run and adds fuel to its own fires. But as innumerable historical experiences have shown, it cannot go on forever. And when it becomes clear that enough is enough, the letdown is likely to be all the more jolting. I think we can date the point where the letdown, the enough is enough uh, situation had arisen at roughly the downturn of 1974-75, which, as you all know, was much more uh, severe than any preceding post-Second World War recession. Not as big or as prolonged as the uh, Great Depression of the 1930s, but nevertheless qualitatively new in the post-Second World War period. Secondly, a huge pileup of debt, both nationally and internationally. This begins at the very end of the war and with only slight jiggles up and down in recessions continues right up to the present time. And the most rapid accumulation of debt has been in the last few years. Let me quote to you a special report in the uh, respected uh, business publication, Business Week, uh, from the uh, issue of October 16th. Since late 1975, the United States has created a new debt economy. I'm quoting now. A credit explosion so wild and so eccentric that it dwarfs even the borrowing binge of the early 1970s. Internationally, and now I'm quoting again. The massive flow of funds from the international market is enabling nations to keep rolling over old debt and taking on new debt nearly without limit. In just four years, the industrialized countries of the world have doubled their euro market debt. The less developed countries that do not export, export oil have tripled their euro market debt. And now even many of the OPEC nations themselves are borrowing on so vast a scale that they will owe nearly $10 billion by the end of this year, that's 1978, compared with a mere 900 million in 1974. All this borrowing, of course, had its counterpart in spending, that is to say in buying, and hence acted as a buoying factor on the various national and international aspects of the economy, the world economy. But I don't suppose there's anybody who seriously would claim that that can go on forever. Although there are many perfectly prepared to act as though it could. Now for many reasons, some related to what has already been said, the United States has continued to run huge balance of payments deficits and hence to flood the world with dollars far beyond the needs of the international monetary system. Now, you will be told 
by the press, the media, and by many economists that the reason for this persisting deficit in the balance of payments is the large uh, increase, the quadrupling of the price of petroleum in 19, uh, 60, uh, 1973, 4, and by various other special factors. This is a complete fallacy. Uh, Germany and, and Japan import a lot more oil than the United States, They're much more dependent on imported oil. Both of them have huge balance of payments surpluses. Uh, they, uh, as a matter of fact, also the, the OPEC countries, the oil exporting countries, send back more dollars to the United States in various forms than the United States uh, loses to them through the increased price of petroleum. These are, are simply uh, scapegoats for the real reason for the pushing out of the dollars and the persistent deficit. And that is the costs of running the world. Uh, <laughs> maintaining uh, huge military bases, of, uh, maintaining subsidies of a military and economic sort for all kinds of clients, trying to hold this global system together in the coherent whole which I described under increasingly adverse conditions and therefore at increasing cost. And those dollars, the criminal dollars that are producing all this trouble you hear so much about, that's the real origin of where they come from. And it's now gone to the point where the United States cannot, and don't let anybody fool you about the big changes that were inaugurated on November 1st by Carter, cannot control the deficit without giving up the role in the world, the dominant role in the world, which it has held all by itself in the whole period since the Second World War. The net result of this continuing outflow of dollars, and by the way, that outflow is not anything that started in 1974 or uh, 5. It goes way back. In fact, it's been happening pretty much ever since the Second World War because that's when the costs of empire began to run as high as they are in this period. But the net result of all that is that there are now sloshing around in the world outside the United States uh, dollars that have been estimated to amount to as much as 600 or 700 billion. These are held in foreign banks uh, and in effect are the value of what they hold disappears. So they're really in a dilemma, in a bind. They would like to get rid of them and every chance they get to sneak a few in, change them into yen or into marks or Swiss francs, they grab the opportunity. But at the same time, they are perforce uh, obliged to keep on accepting them at the risk of upsetting the whole apple cart. It's a very excruciating dilemma, but this huge overhang of dollars is like a sword of Damocles over the dollar and can at any time recreate conditions like or even worse than the near panic selling of dollars of last October, which gave rise to Nixon's, act, uh, excuse me, Nixon, Carter's actions of uh, November 1st. Uh, that was not always altogether a, a Freudian slip. After all, Nixon's actions in 71 have many uh, similarities to Carter's actions in, in 78. And at some point, this tension between the desire to get rid of the dollars and the need to hold on to them 
may give way to a panic, save everybody for himself, save as much as he can while the saving is good, and that could easily lead to a international monetary panic, similar perhaps, so we can imagine what it might be like, by going back to what happened after the last comparable incident, not the same, but comparable in the sense of, of imparting a shock to the system. That was the, uh, the bankruptcy, the collapse of the Austrian Credit Anstalt in 1931, which triggered the international financial collapse of 1931-33 and led to the breakup of the international economy, the trading system, and the monetary system of the 20s, and in its place was put the, uh, the uh, supranationalist type of protectionism, currency blocks, uh, national controls on flow of money and capital and so on, which characterized the period from 1931 <coughs> on to the Second World War. And uh, another, and this would be the fourth tendency that's been at work underneath the surface, largely out of sight during this 25-year period of, of unprecedented prosperity, is a growing inequality between the countries of the center and the countries of the periphery with an attendant exacerbation of the tensions and contradictions of the system as a whole, and a proliferation of national liberation struggles aiming to achieve escape from the constraints and ties of the global capitalist system and its, its uh, network of domination. Now by that I'm not implying that the periphery was in any way excluded from the accumulation process during these years. It wasn't. But in the case of the underdeveloped countries of the periphery, it took its own special forms, mostly under the aegis of multinational corporations based in the center and aiming not to develop the peripheral countries, but to increase the corporation's own profit. And in pursuit of this purpose, the multinational corporations go into the third world, not with a view to restructuring their markets uh, in the interests of their own people, but with a view to maximizing their profits from existing markets where their type of technology, their type of know-how can, can be most effective. And those markets in the third world are of two kinds. One, the demand for consumption goods of a relatively small upper income group, maybe 20% of the population, uh, which in the past has traditionally imported its luxuries, motor cars, uh, appliances, all of the uh, most sophisticated consumer goods which characterize a much broader uh, mass market in the developed, the advanced capitalist countries. Uh, that has been one of the markets that, and the most important, type of markets that the multinational corporations have gone into the third world to provision. Secondly, international markets for which the demand originates outside of the third world countries themselves. Uh, and in either case, the great mass of the people in the third world don't figure as attractive markets. 
in fact, they figure as cost of production. And it is in the interest of the multinational corporation to keep the wages and the prices of their products, if they happen to be farmers or peasants, down to an absolute minimum so that the profit from the consumption good, the consumption market of the upper crust and the international market can be maximized. For this reason, capitalist industrialization in the third world, which is a new thing in history, it didn't amount to much before the Second World War, and certainly not under the aegis of the multinational corporations or the mother countries, has grown greatly, but has gone along typically with the ruthless exploitation of indigenous human and natural resources. The appropriate and indeed the necessary complement of this kind of economic development in the political sphere is the brutal police military dictatorships which are fast becoming the norm throughout the capitalist dominated regions of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The upshot of all these coexisting trends and tendencies is twofold. In the center, faltering accumulation, stagflation, and an out of control blow up of the debt structure. I spoke of the lagging of accumulation due to uh, the overproduction of uh, means of production in the preceding quarter century. That means that the, uh, the market for industrial consume, uh, capital goods has been very sluggish in the recent period. That is one of the, I would say, the key element in the stagflation of this period. The, Inflation part of this, that's the stagnation part. Deflation, the inflation part of it, is another problem. Uh, and uh, I don't want to try to go into that. I think you had some pretty good discussions of that earlier in the week by Professors uh, Thoreau and, uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I, I wasn't here, so I don't know to what extent they, they I know, Lester Thoreau has done some extremely good work on that problem, and I think uh, Jim Tobin probably holds the same view that, uh, that uh, once an inflation gets started, it's extremely hard to stop because expectations are built in and the whole economy becomes increasingly indexed, uh, formally or informally, to the rising uh, level of prices and doesn't matter very much whether there's full employment of resources or, st or stagnation, the process continues right along. And to break it uh, would involve not a slowing down as Carter and company now wishfully think, but would involve a genuine smash up, a real depression that could indeed break the inflation, but obviously politically nobody's going to go in and deliberately create it. It might come, but it won't come as a matter of policy. Uh, so in the center, faltering accumulation, stagflation, and an out of control blow up of the debt structure. In the periphery, declining real standards of living for the mass of people astronomical rates of unemployment, often reaching 40 or 50 percent of the labor force. That's the case, incidentally, uh, in our nearest third world neighbor, Mexico. I think 50 percent is a conservative estimate of the amount of unemployment and severe underemployment in Mexico. Uh, but that's only an extreme case. 
misery, malnutrition, starvation on an increasing scale with no let up or improvement in prospect. Both parts of the system, I think it's no exaggeration to say, are in full crisis. Different kinds of crisis, to be sure. But together, they mean that the whole system is also in full crisis. That breaking points are already being reached is indicated by certain recent developments. The near stock market and dollar panics of the last week in October. Stock market went down 100, Dow Jones, 100 points from around 900 to 800 in a, a, in a week or so. Uh, the dollar was tumbling in an in a unprecedentedly rapid way. These were checked only by uh, quite uh, un unusual, vigorous uh, measures by the government, but nothing in the underlying situation has changed by that, and there's no reason to suppose that these uh, symptoms may not be resumed uh, almost any time. I myself uh, had for the first time a premonition that something like 1929 was happening that week in October. I remember it. I was 19 years old then, and my father happened to be working in Wall Street. And it was an indelible memory, the fall of just about October, as I remember, of 1929. I had that feeling. Uh, I was wrong, but I don't think entirely, uh, I don't think it was entirely irrelevant. That is a symptom in the center. In the periphery, what do I need to say? Iran, that's, that happened essentially beginning a year ago, but the acute phase started also at the end of October and the beginning of November. And the U.S., of course, is going, perfectly obviously, to do its utmost to try to restore the status quo ante in Iran, but it looks very much like a losing game now. And if the U.S. tries too hard, it may only succeed in pushing Iran straight out of the global capitalist system altogether. I don't mean into the arms of the Soviet Union either. I mean as a, a relatively independent country trying to make it on its own. I don't know whether that's possible for any country to do nowadays. But a relative independence compared to what Iran has had in the last 25 years uh, certainly should be attainable. And it seems pretty clear that uh, Iran is not going to be returned to the status of uh, a regional sub-imperialist policeman of the Persian Arab state uh, Gulf uh, in any near future, if ever. But quite apart from the specifics of the present situation and what may happen in the near future, and I wouldn't want to predict, I, I think all we can do is to say possibilities and we can, we can identify certain trends. We can't predict what is likely to happen because as I said earlier, this system is so complex there's so many variables and so many combinations and permutations possible that prediction is foolishness and surprise is the normal. But apart from the, those immediate situations, there is a much larger question at issue. 
The present crisis of the world capitalist system is the result of forces which have been at work at least for the last quarter of a century, at least since the reconstitution of the system on a new basis after the Second World War. And these forces are still at work. In fact, they are inherent in the system itself. Unless something totally unexpected happens, for example, a major war, they will obviously continue to work. They can't be stopped or controlled by national governments, and there is no such thing as an international government. This doesn't mean the end of the global capitalist system of capitalism. No social order collapses and disappears. It has to be overthrown and replaced. But the time is coming, I think, when more and more of us will have to give thought to how it can be replaced before irreparable damage is done to the whole human race. Thank you.